welcoming you tonight and for every reading. And tonight's a very special meeting. We're very really happy to have these two wonderful readers tonight. My name is Carolyn Keaton, and uh, my husband was Ifani Minkiti, who bought this store 15 years ago from Louisa Solano. And um, he passed away almost three years ago now. And my children and I have pledged, my four children and I have pledged to keep this place going. We think it's sacred and we think it's beautiful and very important. So uh, welcome and enjoy the evening. I'm sure it's a very special evening. And welcome to the Zoom people that are here. <laughs> Before uh, our intro Fiona gives the introductions, I want to wish Carol a very happy birthday today. Is her birthday? We're so grateful to you, Carol. Uh, thank you for keeping this shop open. Happy birthday. <laughs> Hi, my name is Fiona. I'm the intern here at Grolier. I have the honor of introducing the poets tonight. Sylvie Condi is the author of three collections of poetry published by Gallimard. As a historian, she specializes in the complex conversations between Africa and Europe, Africa and its diasporas, notably the issue of mystiage, hybridity. A member of Pan America and the Association of Elaichi Lulu Grand Alumni, she teaches at Sunny Old Westbury in the, his in the History and Philosophy Department. Her latest collection, The Never-Ending Quest for the Other Shore, an epic in three cantos, was published by Wesleyan earlier this year. Danielle Legros Gordas, a creative and critical writer, translator, and academic whose work crosses the fields of contemporary U.S. poetry, black and African diasporic literature, Caribbean, Latin American, and Haitian studies, and literary translation. She has received recent fellowships and grants from Mass MoCA, the Massachusetts Cultural Council, and the Penn Heme Translation Fund. She is the former po Poet Laureate of Boston and a professor of creative writing at Lesley University. Her most recent book is Island Heart, published by Subpress Books in 2021, translations of the poem of Ida Faubert. for the warm uh, welcome I'm receiving here at uh, Gros Lieu. Uh, I'm really delighted to be, to be here tonight. Uh, I would like to uh, thank uh, my, uh, for their support my American publisher, Wesleyan University Press, my French publisher, Gallimard, as well as the translator of the Never Ending Quest for the Other Shore, who couldn't be with us, but really brings us together tonight. Special thanks to Danielle Lebrou georges for all the care and dedication she poured into, uh, into that uh, event. And a heartfelt thanks to all of you for uh, your interest in our work. As uh, the evening unfolds, uh, you may notice that Danielle's work and uh, mine um, in spite of their distinctiveness, have some similarities. The most striking one uh, being perhaps uh, uh, the, the reverence they manifest for words. Daniel and I love words for their beauty, uh, evidently, for their strengths, but also for their accent and possibly their gender since uh, both of us are speakers of Roman-derived languages. I believe that we love words um, most, uh, most of all for their agency. Indeed, words can readily uh, lend themselves to all sorts of poetic moves, but they also know how to resist the author's intent and to make demands 
in terms of the temporality they prefer to exist in, the way they want to be arranged on the page, their relation with one another and with blank space in between them and in the margins. As to me, uh, I uh, feel that poetry writing is both an exhilarating and humbling experience for that very reason. I had to face the words agency I just described right from the start when I wrote the incipit of what I intended to be a piece of prose. But immediately, I realized through the way the phrases breathed, the elevated lexicon that imposed itself on me, uh, the alliterations, the assonances, the grandiose scope of things, uh, that not only was I writing poetry, but epic poetry at that. I must confess that more than once, uh, the poem and, and I engage in a tug of war. Soon enough, uh, however, I decided to embrace its desire to be written uh, uh, to me as an epic poem, yet I resisted its iron will when I felt that I had to change the pace, revisit an element, substitute a, a word based on its envisioned reception, Etc. I must also confess that I was not ready to write epic poetry, mostly because of the nationalist and masculine, masculinist connotations associated with a genre that is generally considered as obsolete. Uh, more on my uh, strategies uh, later uh, to deal with that particular issue. But since the, the, an epic poem is a long narrative piece, uh, let me for, for now summarize the two stories that mirror one another in the never-ending quest for the other shore. The poem brings together the apocryphal Atlantic voyages uh, of the 14th century West African, Af African emperor, Abu Bakr II, uh, who may have been the predecessor of the famed Mansa Musa, and the perilous journeys on boats undertaken uh, by contemporary African migrants. As you know, since the 1990s, uh, when more and more restrictive policies began preventing subjects of former colonies to come to Europe, uh, a small minority of African migrants chose to cross borders to the desert or the Mediterranean that has become, as a result of this, one of the world's largest mass grave. Mm -hmm. And instead of generating a, a debate on migration as a human right, their efforts have been misrepresented as either an invasion, mm, a, a trope of extreme right-wing discourses, or at best, and in the press specifically, as a desperate attempt to obtain shelter in the West, or to possibly unduly uh, access crumbs of its wealth. As more and more reports on migrants landing more dead than alive on European shores and pictures of capsizing boats were published, I completed a research for an essay on medievalism in Amadou Kuruma's novel. Amadou Kuruma is a, a writer from uh, Ivory Coast. In the course of this research, I came across an amazing piece written by Al Umari. A 14th century historian of Arab uh, origin, Al Umari transcribed the alleged conversation that took place between Mansa Musa, uh, the 14th century Malinke emperor, on his Hajj pilgrimage to Mecca, and the governor of Cairo. Uh, who was himself eager to learn about Mali, specifically its Islamic practices, uh, the source of its abundant gold, and the way Musa ascended to power. Mansa Musa's response was that his predecessor, Mansa Abu Bakr II, refused to believe that there was nothing be behind the horizon, and, uh, and that one day, uh, he decided uh, to leave with 1,000 boats for him and his men 
1,000 more for food and water. I had now the prism I needed to show that contemporary migrants who dare cross the ocean on fragile boats embark not just for socio-economic reasons, but also, but rather, in search of knowledge about other shores and other people, in search of their own truth and with great panache. For this is what Abu Bakr uh, the second did, giving up all the gold of the Mali Empire to get closer to the horizon and move beyond, a quick, quintessentially poetic journey. He was never seen uh, again, and uh, you know it's a little bit reminiscent of uh, Don, uh, the King Don Sebastian, especially seen uh, through uh, Fernando Pessoa's poetry. So um, the, 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 the never-ending quest for the other shore uh, is a middle passage poem, and it emerged from the conjunction of a pang and of horror and an awe. Uh, indeed, uh, such hubristic enterprises, be there in the Middle Ages or today, had to be re retold under the form of an epic so that the form espouses the content and the agenda, illustrating that migrants' travel are foundational for the advent of a new humanity, what Edouard Glissant called the two monde, and that migrants are today's unsung hero. So indeed, the poem was right, uh, uh, right in target when it pushed me uh, towards uh, epic as a genre. Uh, the the po poem is divided into uh, three cantos. Uh, the two first ones are devoted to Abu Bakr II and the third one uh, to contemporary uh, migrants, but together they make a single statement, uh, which I uh, <laughs> described already. Uh, so I will now read the incipit of the first canto that begin in media rel, uh, as the med medieval paddlers know that they are lost at sea and yet continue because it is useless, because it is the honorable thing to do. And you will maybe hear an echo of, uh, of Suetonus' famous phrase, you know, Ave, Imperator, Moriturite, Salutant, those who will die salute you. Ever since they row, songless, no heave a hoe, for how long, how to know? How many seasons, how many mirage islands the wind will sow? Did they row past pitched drunk and swollen with spin drift? A foggy memory of what it is to have one's feet on the ground and eyelids fluttering, they heed nothing at present. But the wave that goes slips away and returns. Country folk who met themselves belated mariners, their bodies cadence them to cleave with the oars tented tip, the purple mounds of the great salt savanna, which no furrow marks where no seed take, takes root, but to say the sea, earthly words are little suited. At the point of the dream, there were a million, no less and no more, to cross the coral barrier in laughter with its vermilion flowers. There remained but three barks adrift, four so full to the point of capsizing. With paddling, their arms have become paddles, hard driven into their brown and knotted trunks, and their salt-eaten feet are now no more than stumps that cleave to the hull with the agony of seven wounds. In their dizzying heights of suffering, they yet find the strength to row. Oh, the arrogant zeal of those who know their death approaches and prefer to gaze beyond what's certain. In the foremost boat, they row in fine unison. 
baron and captive, craftsmen and archer, a remaining bit of color at the edge of their bitter lips, and without pose, aside from two buggers wallowing in the bilge, who cease to rumble only to hold at the boardless cloud drooling imprecations. Their folly just now brought forth noisily displays itself. Aside also from the boy ever so young who the pitch of the sun consumes and scorches. Yet he had promised to his beloved to return with so much afflu affluence and luster that even his mediocre birth would be forgotten and that he would make good his pretension to make of her at all costs his honor. I shall last upon the water. When I return, will you love me well? From the second boat, the one on duty for the dead will be requested to sink the child with the slightest cer ceremony, or else a few prayers, it depends. Taciturn, the other roars are still pulling hard, all the more firmly, all the more supperly, that effort no longer has an end for now. Such torment in these trials. Uh, I uh, often define my poem as neo-epic. I could have said post-epic as well. Uh, because I wanted to announce that I intended to disturb the assumptions that contribute to define the epic corpus, uh, namely the glorification of an emerging nation, the center stage offered to male courage and to war constructed as a locus where physical violence visited upon powerful enemies is the measure of heroism. So in response to that, I selected 14th century Mali uh, because it was a loose federation of a large number of diverse people speaking various languages whose center was actually moving and even ubiquitous. And uh, Mali was not a nation, per se. I also convinced myself that an epic does not celebrate a victory, but a defeat. And I follow uh, on that uh, Edouard Glissant's in intuition, and that this defeat asks more, more pressing questions from the community it coalesces and from the others than a victory uh, could, uh, could. My box uh, welcomed women, skills, uh, skilled and independent women who do not hesitate to express dissent. I even took uh, uh, liberty with cultural history in making a woman the griot of the emperor. As you know, the, the Greek griots are memorialists, okay? they, uh, they are historians and poets at the same time. Uh, there are many uh, types of griots, but the one that would be associated with the emperor would be uh, generally uh, a man. I made this person uh, a woman. Uh, because I had the intuition that the presence of women would help deconstruct many of the binaries inherent to traditional epics, for instance, the strict division between the forces of, of the good and uh, those of the evil on which many epic narratives rest. So uh, could I ask you to please read uh, an excerpt? Sure, why don't you stand with me? <laughs> or sit? Okay. Uh, there's a reference to a pinas, which is a small boat, and then a pierogi, which uh, is a um, long canoe. Mm -hmm. In the third pinas, that of the women, another custom prevails. Four among them have dived beneath the waterline in order to patch up the hull. Others bail out the rising water with calabashes. Beneath the canopy, a lovely lady has her russet hair braided and finds distraction in observing her lady friend's massage, while three girls relentlessly try to catch fish. <laughs> Apart from the rest, 
is the one whose belly refuses seed and who wished to offer her ordeal and her youth to repay an old debt in truth contracted by others long ago. Which is to say that despite the breaches and cracks, she holds back the swell, this tertian perug that strives and toils. There is laughter, prayer, rowing. There are wisecracks aplenty about men. And every kind of song, even death, is derided and unabashedly. Thank you. Um, in uh, my my poem is also neo epic in the sense that it responds to Edouard Glissant's call for uh, 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 an epic that would sing the relation which he defined as the unpredictable ramification of chance encounter uh, between people or uh, nations. Uh, in fact, the never-ending quest for the other shore borrows a number of threads uh, to, uh, from various epic traditions uh, from Africa and Europe mostly. It honors what they have in common for instance, a deep sense of formulaic praise, uh, the idea that the hero is elusive, is, the, is he heroic by virtue of being born or through his deeds? This is a question that Blanchot, for instance, um, uh, examined. And of course, orality. Uh, my poem acknowledges their differences, for instance, the existence of epic song songs sung by cooperative associations in, in West Africa, such as the Hunter. And uh, it also looked at the complicated relationship of the epic with divinity. So, um, uh, Daniel, can, can I ask you to, to read uh, t two passages, if time permits? Um, uh, in, uh, in the first one, uh, we see the construction of the boats, on those thousand boats. I, read, I wrote the first uh, canto and I felt that I still didn't know enough about what had happened. So I had to go back, revisit this expedition and try to look uh, for, uh, you know, amplify the vision and look at uh, what happened before they left and how the boats were constructed. I think this passage is, is about that. So it really uh, reflects also the, the uh, the, the tendency for uh, uh, an epic poem to play on amplification, enumeration, um, uh, and, and uh, the, the, in the passage, I, I believe that there is a, the voice of uh, also the, the one who retells the story at all points. I, I wanted to uh, remind the readers that this is a story being told. Huh? So you see a little bit. And the, and the last one, um, in the last one, you will see. Um, uh, a reworking in the text of um, you know the, the, the Uly Ulysses and the, and the sirens, hmm? uh, so as a way of bringing to the text you know the epic tradition from uh, from various places. So thank you. Very much. This is um, in the 14th century and uh, in preparation for the journey. The 12 gates of Mali sent in abundance and without wavering tributes and emissaries to the point that the flower of every clan was soon gathered at the shore. Under the conduct of their princes were found there Argulets and marabouts, artisans, sages, not to mention the spiritual leaders and their formidable bully. Even a conclave of lepers had withdrawn behind a clump of trees from which they set out at night to urge one or another of your lieutenants to save them 
if nothing else, at least a feluca. Rejected each time they returned to their camp, chanting an irritating refrain. Don't castigate those afflicted by the great malady. An envious man, an ungrateful woman, inflicted it upon us. Don't castigate us. Jealousy is everywhere, and your turn is not far enough away. And to pass the time, regattas were organized farces, recitations, and quarrels, entertaining tam-tams and wrestling matches. All things were brought, were bought and sold while conversing gaily, and whorls of incense rose in the guard huts. Gawkers then by the thousand and clumps of children rejoicing were there for the simple delight of wishing you welcome and to catch a glimpse of the eagle eye, of your august countenance made up with antimony, of its aquiline nose and high cheekbones. I salute your weariness, epiphanic vulture, dreaded bird of prey none can call in. Well met and long life to you, lord of the rain-tipped wings. You land everywhere that suits you, but only luck sits upon your head. To speak clearly and in short, your ascendancy over us, Mansa, was total. So now in the contemporary moment of the African violence. If, in the light of day, we had launched, we would have seen among us, sitting askew, death, who, to take up less space, crossed its legs like a saintly hypocrite and precious to boot. Don't trouble yourself on my account. This bit of bench for my needs will suffice. It had pulled out a toothpick from its duffel. Ah, if there had been more sun, I might have found out. Painted on the hull of our bucket, between two friezes and an envoy, was displayed the name Chiron, repeated as a litany for clarity's sake. To all people of good faith embarked the obscure waters of immemorial chaos, where the jinn furiously unravel their long lame manes flying in the gusts of wind, a thousand regrets, a thousand regrets, truly, in traversing these strident cesspools, terror racked even the least timorous who the captain had bound to a tether to check their plunge into the deep together. Those nights, Alassan, or was it Tiano, intoned long funeral laments that the void teeming with dubious mysteries echoed back to us. Thank you. Thank you. So moved by the project of the book. It's, it's just expands. It's it, all of what it takes up and, and what it links as well. Um, and it's politics. So um, thank you for letting me read your work, CUV, um, and, uh, and for sharing the space with you. Thank you, Brolier, for hosting us uh, this evening, Carol and the McKitty family, and James and Fiona and uh, Elizabeth. Uh, also thinking about Louisa Solana. Uh, so
So hello, hello, uh, <laughs> hello everyone, uh, and hello everyone here. And thanks for being with us. It's it's a beautiful evening. So um, so sitting in a poetry shop, I think you know one had choices, and you're here. So I'm so grateful. I'm going to be reading from um, my my book of poem of translations. I'm, I'm just going to get my time my time my analog watch <laughs> to help me keep time. Uh, and uh, I'm going to be reading from this book um, entitled Island Heart. It's uh, some poems of Ida Faubert, translated by me, published by Self Press. Thank you, Dan Bouchard, if you're out there. And um, I, uh, Ida Faubert was a Haitian-French uh, poet born in 1882, she lived until 1969. And so uh, I want to share a little bit of her biography, which I hope will give you the sense of why I found her of great interest, um, uh, in addition to uh, her, her being a Haitian literary foremother for me. I, I am Haitian. Uh, she was a complex figure who didn't fit easily or conform to socially prescribed uh, categories for women of color whether in Haiti or in France. She was the daughter of a Haitian president, Lucius Salomon, and a French mother, uh, Florentine Gutierrez. Uh, her father was given a coup d'etat when uh, little Ida was six years old, and so her family moved to France, where she was raised. Uh, and in her 1903, in her early 20s, she returned to uh, Port-au-Prince, to Haiti, where she made an impression on members of Port-au-Prince's cultural elite because of her writing, uh, her charm, her lineage. Uh, and she became part of an influential literary movement called La Ronde, um, which flourished at the end of the 19th century uh, in the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, its poets pursued and, and articulated the need uh, for a universal lyric one that would place Haitian literature in the perceived larger stream of Francophone, particularly French letters. I mean, this could be seen as a reaction, but Haitian indigenism, um, negritude, and Harlem Renaissance were just being born and were not full blown um, at the time um, of, uh, of the, the existence of uh, this movement of La Ronde. So Faubert's poems began um, to appear in Haitian literary journals in uh, 1912 under her own name, which was unusual for Haitian women writers at the time. Um, despite the success, uh, she found the mores and the strictures of Port-au-Prince's high society stifling, and I think she also engaged in some reckless behavior. Um, and so she returned to France in 1914, uh, just before the outbreak of World War One. in Europe and also a year prior to the U.S. Uh, invasion and, and subsequent occupation um, of, of Haiti, which would deeply shake uh, Haitian society and help engender the Haitian indigenous um, um, movement. Uh, and so um, Jean Price uh, Mars, uh, who articulated the concept of indigenism in Haiti, and Ida Faubert were great and so I imagine there were some conversations. And she, I, I'd like to imagine her as being part of uh, the birth of, uh, or connected to the, the uh, indigenous, the birth of the indigenous movement in Haiti. So back in, in France, in Paris, she was a, Faubert was a woman of letters. She attended lectures, literary events, opened up her own salon to receive artists and intellectuals, um, hung out on uh, Paris, uh, uh, in Paris's Bohemian Left Bank and frequented feminist and lesbian writers and spaces. And um, one of the reasons I was especially drawn to Faubert is because she refused the popular tropes assigned to women of color uh, in the contemporary white European imagination. And um, while she didn't pronounce an overt lesbianism or queerness or, or overt feminist feminism, I consider her, if, if not a feminist, a, a proto-feminist, uh, and, uh, and believe her to, be, to have been queer. And uh, in decades following World War II, Faubert maintained contact with friends, uh, 
writer's colleagues in Haiti, welcoming them when they visited France. Uh, she promoted and participated in the movement of Haitian writers and literature in Haiti and France and is now considered one of uh, Haiti's uh, great women poets. So, uh, I'm going to read to you some of her poems. These poems were published in uh, her book, Coeur des Îles, um, which I've um, translated as Island Heart. And um, they're written in a style that is anachronistic to this, the moment in which she was living, the modernist moment. She was writing in this romantic style, evocations of nature and intense psychological states. And this is before her indigenous before her, her writing was informed by indigenous values. Her, she would write short stories later in, in which these values are, are evident. So, um, spring morning, even though it is a spring evening. Deep along the path, the flowering cunipies disperse a fragrance, vanilla and light. A buzzing swarm of morning bees comes into the pale day, joyous, vibrating, seeking their prized pollen within the corolla. In the bright morning, butterflies take flight. A sun, sun ray kisses the head of a rose, which stirred won't admit having lost its sleep. A perfume spreads beneath the tall palm trees, a fragrance of spring, of frenzied things. And I fill my arms with blossoming flowers, with jasmine and roses, with lilies and lilacs, and listen charmed to the water's murmur, to the bird song in the branches. The skies are erupting, the sun is on fire, and I feel in my soul all this spring singing. Spring morning must, of course, be followed by tropical night. <laughs> and I will read to you Fauvert's original Tropical night, and um, and read to you my English and which will be followed by my English translation, so that you can hear in French the uh, rhyming and uh, the meter rhythm. Soir tropical. Le soir est lumineux. Le soir est tendre et beau. Le soleil se déteinte. La lune est sur les roses. Une langueur pénètre au cœur même des choses. Les grands palmiers noirs rêvent au bord de l'eau. Les jasmins ont mêlé leurs branches étoilées aux lianes en fleurs. La laine de l'été caresse les fruits lourds. La grave volupté laisse traîner son voile au détour des années. Là-bas, sur le chemin, Pas un chant, pas un bruit. Rien ne trouble la paix d'un bonheur qu'on écoute. Viens sentir les parfums sur le bord de la route et respirer mon âme. Tropical night. The night is luminous. The night is tender and beautiful. The sun has obscured itself. The moon rests on the roses. A languor enters the very heart of things in the tall black palms dream at the water's edge. The jasmine have mixed their star-studded branches with lianas in the moon. Summer's breath caresses the heavy fruit. The dense sensuality lets its long veil linger along the sinuous paths. Over there, on the way, not a song, not a sound, 
Nothing disturbs the peace and the joy we listen to. Come, take in the fragrances at the road's edge, and breathe in my soul, spread across night. <laughs> I think, you know, the while these are, clear, well, I, I can't say clearly not political, I, I think the existence of this work uh, is, um, is not disconnected to a, a political statement. That Faubert is writing on her own terms, is publishing uh, in, uh, under her own name, and is, is, um, is putting out these exquisite poems. Faubert uh, is a great writer of love poems. Some about the beauty of love, some about the badness of love. <laughs> <laughs> Mon amour, attendez. Wait, my love. When you forget that you held me captive in your arms, like a thing that was yours. When you grow tired of my sweet love, wait until night falls to tell me. Then you won't see my undone face, my sorry eyes, my trembling mouth. The dark will veil my crushing sorrow. Wait until night falls completely. Wait until the wind makes the trees wail and the birds of the woods weep in their nests. Then you won't hear my sobs or the cry of my heart colder than marble. Wait until thunder darkens the skies and it pours nearby on the road. And in the sad night, you'll mistake, no doubt, the tears of my eyes with the tears of the sky. One day, you'll forget that you held me captive in your arms like a thing that was yours. So to tell me this, have the sweetest words. Wait, my love, until night falls. <laughs> yeah, for girls like that. <laughs> now, um, I reference for girls queerness. And um, this is uh, a rondelle dedicated to a Madame Hergé. And things apparently did not go well with Madame Hergé. Rondelle. Uh, and and it's, it's a form, and so you'll hear some repeating lines. With your bewitching eyes, whose dark beauty haunts us. With the seductive grace of the most charming fowler. You're like the lovely buds of the enchanting blue countries with your bewitching eyes whose dark beauty haunts us. To ease all pains your voice is lulling and one thinks you care but you cause such grief with your bewitching eyes. One more poem, um, and uh, and then, which will give us time for conversation, or maybe one poem from here and then one poem from here. A sonnet, a sonnet à Pierre Loti, sonnet to Pierre Loti, and um, Pierre Loti was a French novelist and naval officer uh, living between 1850 and. and 1923, 
who um, wrote in great detail of his travels, uh, and Faubert read his novels with great interest. There's a reference to the Spahi, S-P-A-H-I, uh, and the Spahi is a member of the French cavalry uh, recruited from North Africa. Um, the Spahi fought, so these African soldiers fought in the first and second um, wars for France. Sonnet, uh, sonnet to Pierluti. Oh, dear artist, oh, creator of dreams, to my soul, your soul spoke. And I followed you, a sweet and sad exile, in the far-flung lands where you went restlessly. I knew the Spahi who lay heaving on the shore. I felt him die in my deserted heart and took in his goodbye his veiled gaze in the grave and calm hour of the rising moon. O pilgrim of anchor, I followed you. I saw the great lotuses, the pagodas of gold, the deep eyes of the saddened bells who weep in silence and sigh soundlessly, dreaming of a joy they will never achieve. Loti, I resemble your disillusioned ones. Ida Fauvet. stateless poem. If you are born and you are stateless, if you are born and you are homeless, if your state and home are not yours and yet everything you know, what are you? Who are you? And who am I without the dark fields I walk upon, the streets I know, the blue corners I call ones you call yours. Who am I to call myself citizen and human and free? And who are you to call yourself landed and grounded and free? And who is judge enough? Who native? Who other? Who are we who move so freely without accents of identification? without skin of identification, with all manner of identification, with gold seals of approval, with stamps of good fortune, with the accident of blameless birth. Who are we to be so lucky? Thank you. I guess I'll start things off. How did you two meet? Would you mind telling us? Well, uh, I was a graduate student at NYU um, in the late 90s, and Sylvie was a faculty member in the French department and also in Africana. Yeah, in Africana studies. And was just doing this in amazing, you know, scholarly critical work, and still is doing this amazing scholarly critical work. And as a woman of color, um, and there were not too many uh, among the faculty, <laughs> it was just, it was just so wonderful to, to behold this this uh, uh, this person, this this mentor, this great thinker, uh, uh, who also had this creative side to her. So. So that's kind of how we met, yeah, in my admiration. Thank you. <laughs> 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 
So translation is usually a game of trade-offs. You have to sort of, you can't do everything. You have to have maybe follow the metrical pattern or maybe kind of dispense with that to bring the meaning in more. So what, as a, as a translator, what sort of things do you value more to? Yeah, um, well, uh, with this book, I decided to eschew the rhymes um, for what, uh, in, in the interest of trying to get to as close to what I understood as, as, as the meaning of the text. Um, and, and I did that for that reason, but also because the 21st century U.S. reader, I think, is not in the habit of reading rhyme verse. So, and I wanted this text very much to exist in this moment for this for this moment's reader. So I, I was not gonna um, I was not gonna rhyme, and also because it would have been like really challenging. <laughs> not that I couldn't do it, but it was just gonna, uh, you know. And and I I was pursuing you know, something else, meaning what I understand of this. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, Alexandre Dicao did a, a wonderful job uh, translating the, the text that is complex in, in French. French. I myself uh, sort of um, uh, uh, steered away from rhymes for the very, very reason that you mentioned. You know, it's, uh, today it, uh, it sounds a little bit labor laborious, but uh, instead of that, I created a system of assonances and alliteration within. The, the voices themselves, and uh, I think Alexandre managed to keep a lot of that. Here and there, I had an Alexandrine because that's the way I was raised, <laughs> and, and this is because the topic sort of called for that. I, I purposefully uh, made the choice to use a vocabulary, uh, to, to, uh, to refrain from using a vocabulary that is exclusively uh, reserved for Africa. Mm, the kind of exotic type of the hearts and the chiefs and, and I used uh, another type of vocabulary hoping to sort of decolonize you know language in, in that in that manner um, and um, and uh, I, I uh, so, so I used for to create temporality I used in the first two cantos a kind of uh, oldish French uh, that would be still readable today, uh, but that but that borrows from 16th, 17th century writers here and there. And uh, Alexander Dico had to contend with <laughs> with uh, this language and did a, a wonderful job. Yeah. How did you um, transfer or transform that language? Then was it just in the book? Are those two um, cantos that are very or tend towards traditional French and 16th, 17th century French. How did you, did you go gradually into a more modern French, or is it separate enough that you could do that without it being disruptive? Uh, the, the, the third canto is a very contemporary French uh, with some slang, in fact, because I, I wanted to um, uh, show that uh, the migrants who come, may, it may not be that their first travel, it may, uh, they, they are in fact, uh, uh, you know, uh, Africa is very much aware of Europe and the rest of the West and uh, the, 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 the culture, the language is, uh, is uh, is practiced, you know, the slang is practiced in Africa, just like French, uh, contemporary French has Africanized and to, to a large extent. So I didn't want to connote African, contemporary African migrants are newcomers, uh, but people who are like us, because it may very well be that uh, we become, you know, climatic migrants at, at some point. So, so they are a little bit uh, the foundational type of uh, migrants, and I reflect that by, by their language. Uh, to um, uh, create hmm, a medieval type of um, location on the sea that is by definition sort of atemporal, although we may <laughs> challenge that with what's happening to the sea uh, today. It's, I mean, it's very historically. Uh, situated, uh, but um, in order to do that, um, I, and at the same time be readable, I couldn't use uh, Montaigne's uh, language because of well, I mean, if you read Montaigne's essays, I mean, there are a lot of footnotes. But I would pick up 
a number of terms uh, that would sort of connote that uh, that period, uh, but in a in a kind of flow that would allow the, the reader to uh, to to understand the the, the, the sentence. And uh, and it was not done, you know, artificially. I wanted how do you say without saying, okay, we are in thirteen. Mm -hmm. Ten, you know, how do you mm -hmm. say that? You have to sort of give the words the patina uh, that the time puts on them. So that's what I have attempted to, 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 to create. I love that idea of patina. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I would like to say thank you to Daniel for bringing to life uh, the uh, Ada Faubert. Uh, she's been uh, kept. And, uh, um, in obscurity in Haitian literature, uh, maybe because she's a woman. Uh, 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 they will talk about uh, the, the generation de la ronde, they will talk about uh, all the famous poets, like Xavier Baer, and so but you will not know him. They don't teach us much, much in school about uh, Faubert. Uh, so uh, I really appreciate that you bring it back. You're giving a second life now. To, and, and I would like to say something about, uh, you mentioned the, four, the 14th century Mali. You know, and, uh, but what I'm mostly interested in, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with it, is the 13th century in, uh, Mali. Uh, the, de uh, and the declaration, the statement of, of, of Mende, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, for me, which I consider like the, is a precursor to the uh, uh, human rights, the, the elevation of human rights before the declaration, the universal declaration of the uh, 13th century, he was the, the slave in Mali. Uh, so, um, he was uh, Arab slave. The, the, mas the, the, the slave masters were Arabs, uh, Islamic Arabs, and um, so the, the black Marian uh, rebels against that, and they, they actually won the rebellion against the war. And they made a declaration about how human rights should be respected, which I consider myself a, a, a very important statement. Yeah, so the 13th century was the, the time of the foundation of the Mali Empire, that sort of uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, liberated it, itself from uh, the yoke um, uh, of, uh, of another empire of Ghana that, that existed uh, before, and then uh, the, the, the leadership of Sundiata Keita uh, developed, and Sundiata Keita is credited to have uh, not only conquered land but also established the administration and uh, created a number of institutions, among which uh, the caste system. Uh, and there would be a lot to say about that. So you are alluding to the, the chart of the Mende, mm -hmm. uh, and there are debates about that. Uh, is it really a creation from the 13th century, or has it be, been created later on? I use part of it in the text, you know, in particular an idea such as a life is a life, okay, uh, which is which is quite powerful. And in the the text that we have and that is debated today, there is an allusion to slavery and the, the rejection of uh, of slavery. This is a complicated uh, issue because there was um, uh, a system of Domestic internal slavery in, in uh, African cultures that uh, you know sort of uh, um, coincided also with uh, the type of Oriental slavery that you were alluded to and and um, and came before the transatlantic uh, slave trade, you know, starting in the in the in the in the 15th, 16th century. Uh, so, so the poem is is concerned about you know t t t slavery. In fact, uh, at some point in the passage that uh, later on in the passage that you read, you know, I'm looking at the way people are recruited to get on the boat. Did they come on their free will or were they pushed? Uh, did they find some trickery not to get on the boat? I mean, all all this uh, this type of situation is. Uh, uh, is explored, uh, but beyond that, you know, I'm, I'm also just throwing the idea without really developing it of uh, what could have happened, you know, if uh, if uh, Abu Bakr the Second had uh, 
visited uh, the Americas mm -hmm. before Columbus. So, uh, well, I'm looking at various situations. He could have been a colonizer. He could have, uh, you know, sort of uh, entered into an alliance and, uh, and you know, I just throw, throw this there uh, in a parodic way. You know, I'm creating a parody of all those texts, you know, of, uh, uh, conquering the land or fighting, you know, to to be the one who will be the first. And in, in the first part, in fact, when uh, in the, the the section that I read uh, first, when the mariners know that they uh, they, they they that everything is lost, uh, they um, Abu Bakr the second, you know, take, takes the floor and tells them, encourages them and tells them at least we'll have avoided. Uh, the fate of the conqueror, right? <laughs> uh, so thank you for your, for your question. Thank you for the beautiful reading tonight. Let's give the poets another round of applause.